Hello, everybody, and my name is Ashley Conway. I'm speaking to you from the past to talk about my civil pasture research program um, and give you all an update on what uh, we've been up to in the Conway Lab in 2021 and what we're looking forward to in 2022. So um, this is my third year, moving through my third year at the center, and I, if any of you will recall, was tasked when I arrived, since this position as a civil pasture researcher was new, um, to develop a research program um, in civil pasture that really addressed applied, both applied and basic questions um, concerning the two primary types of temperate hardwood civil pasture that we find commonly in Missouri and then throughout the region. And over the past couple of years, I've done a lot of outreach with producers and talking um, with groups of stakeholders and folks who are interested in civil pasture as a practice. And I still am pretty firmly in the camp that we have two major streams of interest that we're talking about. When we're talking about civil pasture, we're really looking at um, converting native woodlands um, into functioning civil pastures through thinning processes and underplanting and really making use of some of these unmanaged uh, hardwood areas that many small producers have on their property. And then the other flip side of the coin for civil pasture would be a planted civil pasture. It's a little bit more intentional. We're taking open space, putting a specific type of tree into these pastures and creating a really top-down approach to an integrated civil pasture system. So that includes any type of timber production, specialty crops, this really highly integrated polyculture type system that incorporates livestock, and then tree fodder I've added here. Um, uh, previously, I presented this as its own third topic, um, but really it fits well into this uh, plantation civil pasture because often these, these edible perennial hardwood species that we would see um, providing fodder for livestock is seen in this type of plantation civil pasture. So to that end, as I've been developing this program, I've been working on all of these fronts um, and I have now some grants, I have some students and we are just rolling, rocking and rolling here. Um, the first update I'll give and, and my students will talk about their specific roles in these projects um, in their own flash talks, but I'll give you kind of an update on the uh, SARE uh, Research and Education Grant that uh, we, we got last year to really look at the perceptions and practices of woodland civil pasture in Missouri. And if you'll recall, half of this project included taking space that we're, we're using down at Wordak Research Farm to convert previously unmanaged areas into a long-term study site for woodland civil pasture and really look at this conversion process. So we're funded partially in this project um, with this SARE r &E grant. This past year, we collected a lot of baseline data in 44 fixed area plots uh, all throughout the, this 80 acre space in Word Act that we've set aside for this project. Uh, we also marked 85 acres, this whole space for a timber sale, a commercial timber sale, which will also help fund some of the infrastructure costs of the project. And we're looking at completing those bids here um, very soon. And then as far as treatments, we will conduct plot scale, timber seed improvement thinnings and a prescribed burn treatment for year two data collection. So these will be happening in very short order before the growing season begins so that we can look at before and after for both of these treatments on the conversion process. We'll be looking at flora metrics, um, uh, the tree metrics themselves, uh, what the forage performance will do when we plant native um, forages underneath these um, in, in these in these fixed area plots. So these are just some pictures that we've taken of the site. This is uh, Seth Christman, uh, one of the master's students that is working in my lab, who is really just taking this project by the horns and run with it. Um, We've spent many, many hours down at this site, both of us, but him more so through the summer, the heat of summer. And you can see this is what the state of the stands really look like now. They're very thick. Um, and you can see here we have some tape marked around trees that we're planning on keeping. Um, and then everything else is going to be thinned eventually, um, hopefully sooner rather than later, but it's going to happen in multi stages to really create a very open savanna type ecosystem. Um, here's another perspective here of one of the south facing slopes. 
And it was just an amazing place to spend the fall, really. Seth would maybe argue that the summer was not as much fun, but uh, most of the time I spent down there was in the fall and it was just beautiful. Um, found a really lovely lion's mane mushroom, lots of chanterelles, just a really great experience. And we're looking forward to collecting your two of data. Um, furthermore, this is also the site that overlaps with some of Dusty Walter's PhD work. Uh, we have many plots that overlap with ours. We've managed to work around for our study, but I'd love to go back and work on collecting some retrospective data for his previous sites um, before we really en engulf them and, and bring them into the rest of our study. Um, so we are talking about looking at some oak regeneration, capturing some of that oak regeneration data um, longitudinally. So you can see some of these plots here, it might be a little difficult to see, but this is quite a bit thinner. There are not really oak seedlings in this area that hasn't been grazed. But in this grazed area, we have an abundance of regenerated oak seedlings, um, which anecdotally from observation is a really interesting thing because typically we would expect to see fewer oak seedlings um, in grazed areas. And there's, there's a planting treatment in here as well. So I'm gonna spend some time here in the coming year to really plan out how we're gonna collect this data and see if there's anything exciting here to recapture from um, and follow up on with Dusty's old work. So the other front that we're moving forward on, um, really getting at this, this planted silo pasture aspect is really looking at tree fodder, specifically elderberry. Um, so I'd love to give you an update on that project and where we're going with that. Excuse me, we do have a, I, I have another, a new student, Eric McKenzie, who is going to be taking over this aspect of the project. Um, if you recall, we have been collecting the biomass of the elderberry throughout the growing season um, to complete some lab analysis on the nutritive value and the cyanogenic compounds. So we have completed the lab analysis for year one. We're still in the process of sorting through that data and, and um, statistically analyzing it, but the lab work is done uh, as of a few weeks ago. And the next step will be working on the phytochemical analysis for year one data. And we also have collected year two this past summer. Um, so we will also be adding that to the queue for some nutrient analysis and cyanogenic analysis. Um, hopefully with Eric at the helm, this project will pick up pace and we'll really have some concrete data uh, to provide by this time next year. The second aspect of this project is, was looking at ensiling the elderberry, um, which was harvested in the late fall. We did successfully ensile elderberry biomass, which was pretty exciting. And this is um, some of the first results that I'll be able to share with you. We are in the process of finalizing this and getting it written up. Um, if you'll recall from last year, we had a late season collection of quote unquote biomass. So this was a picture of the field. It was about the 30th of November. As you can see, there's not a lot of foliage at all. <laughs> so most of the biomass that was ensiled is actually the canes. Um, that appeared very lignified from this standpoint, but when chopped up were quite green. And so the whole premise was very experimental. So late season collection, we did have four different treatments. We, it was a two by two factorial with two different packing densities, um, a 10 pounds per dry matter and a 15 pounds per dry matter treatment. And then those uh, densities were crossed with either silage inoculation or no inoculation. And we fermented these uh, little mini silos for about 90 days. And what we found is that there really were not serious differences between the treatments, nothing earth shattering, other than the fact that we managed to ensile this, it was pretty exciting. Um, there was a tendency for the high packing density to have slightly more crude protein. And we noticed that the ADF was affected by a silage inoculant. So it was fermented a little bit more, which slightly improved the relative feeding value index of this uh, silage, which overall wasn't a high quality silage as we would expect from this right here. However, the experiment was experimental and we were able to successfully ensile this. So we really have a lot of baseline data to work, for, work towards and forward on to really look at how we can improve this um, forage source and fodder source, particularly by perhaps evaluating earlier harvest dates where we actually do have some leaf biomass and then looking at the subsequent effect on what that does to the elderberry yield and plant growth for the following year. So 
looking forward to going down this rabbit hole a little bit and seeing what elderberry silage has to offer. Uh, here's some of the data. I won't spend too much time, but we do have this tendency here. Um, and it is a 0.06, so a pretty strong tendency for um, the crude protein to be uh, higher in the high density, high packing density silage. And again, this difference in ABF, which subsequently significantly affects the relative feeding value by at least 2% here. So um, overall, 44% relative feeding value is not great. Um, a good old fashioned corn silage is about 115. So we are looking at um, really some, some warming, not super nutritious uh, silage at this stage, but it is a successfully in solid product. And I'd love to see how it actually feeds out um, if we get to that point. So to quickly round up uh, what the updates and outlook for this coming year looks like, uh, I'll reiterate, we do have a new student in our lab. Um, he joined us this past fall, Eric McKenzie, and he will be leading the Elderberry Fodder Project. You'll also hear from Seth, who will talk a little bit more about the SARE project, the WordAC aspect of it. Kendra will also talk a little bit about her involvement, um, primarily on um, her work in Senegal, but she's also rem remember working on the other half of this SARE project, which is a producer survey in Missouri, which we will have some results to share with you next by this time next year as well. So. That's this moving forward on the SARE project, both the survey aspect and the conversion. We're making good time with all of that. Um, in spite of COVID, I think we're, we're looking at um, getting some good results here soon. For Kendra's PhD work, we're also going to work on establishing a grazing trial up at Thompson. Um, so stay tuned for what that ends up looking like. Um, again, Kendra will talk about her Senegal research and her flash talk. We'll have follow-up data from WordAC. And really more yet to come. We have so many ideas and so many networking opportunities. And we're just, we're just absolutely trying to carry, have the momentum carry us here um, on all fronts when it comes to civil pasture. So uh, with that, um, I assume we'll have some time for question and answer here. So I'll, I'll go ahead and, and wrap this up. Thank you so much for your attention and um, we'll talk soon. Hello, my name is Kendra Esparza Harris. I am a second year NEFA fellow in the School of Natural Resources, Center for Agroforestry, co-advised by Dr. Ashley Conway and Dr. Sarah Lavelle with the research focus in civil pasture. Today, I will briefly discuss my upcoming project, the adaptive strategies of pastoral and agricultural communities for management of livestock grazing systems in the commons of Senegal. Livestock production provides economic stability and food security for transhumans and agro-pastoralist communities in Senegal. The traditional transhuman management of livestock involves animal mobility through corridors to secure forage and water sources when local resources are minimal. Persistent land degradation and drought cause inconsistent rainfall and diminish soil quality, which yields a reduction in forage availability and crop production for livestock grazing opportunity. Consequently, transhumanist pastoralists travel further to find adequate grazing potential and compete among sedentary agro-pastoralists and crop farmers for access to water and food. Civil pasture and agroforestry practice of incorporating trees and forage within livestock grazing systems has the potential to mitigate the detrimental effects of desertification, alleviate tensions among pastoralists and crop farmers, and supply adequate variability in forage and fodder. Additionally, civil pasture provides numerous benefits to improve animal health and productivity, diversify economic markets, support wildlife habitats, and improve forest management. The aim of the case study is to understand existing and potentially adaptive livestock integration strategies in response to stressors among pastoralists, agro-pastoralists, and farmers in Senegal. In particular, the case study will focus on the following research questions. What are the adaptive strategies adopted by communities to manage stressors within the commons? And what is the potential of civil pasture as an alternative strategy for sustainable community-oriented land use management of the commons? Through funding of the Bourne National Security and Brown Fellowship, and in collaboration with the Sustainable Development Program for Pastoral Farms in Sahil, 
A qualitative research methodology will be applied in a case study designed to address the proposed research questions within the community adaptive management of the Commons framework in Senegal. Semi-structured interviews will incorporate a narrative inquiry designed to articulate traditional knowledge of agroecological systems, and focus group discussions will include community participatory mapping of resources, participatory observations, and strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats SWOT analysis to promote strategic thinking of the stressors and adaptive strategies and conceptualize potential alternative strategies in the commons. Thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric McKenzie, and I am a first year graduate research assistant working under Dr. Ashley Conway. My master's thesis project will examine the potential use of elderberry as a fodder source for ruminant livestock. Dr. Chung Ho Lin will be performing chemical analyses of the elderberry fodder samples, and in collaboration with Andrew Thomas, his team at the Southwest Research Center in Mount Vernon produced half of the sample fodder with the other half coming from our work at the Horticulture and Agroforestry Research Center in New Franklin. Elderberries ripen and are ready for harvest relatively early, from mid-August to mid-September. After harvest, the leaves stay on the plant well into the fall. The standard management practice for elderberry is to coppice the plants after the growing season. This thesis project will determine the viability of using the post-harvest elderberry plant as a fodder source for ruminant livestock. We will need to analyze the nutritive content, palatability, and safety of using elderberry for this purpose, with the primary concern being the presence of cyanogenic glycosides in the plant. While elderberry is browsed by the native ruminant white-tailed deer, it must be determined if the concentration of this innate toxin in post-harvest elderberries can safely be consumed by conventional ruminant livestock. If so, integrated farming systems could create additional revenue potential by seasonal grazing on mixed-use land and selling products into the burgeoning elderberry market. As a first-year graduate student, my contributions to the experiments are still in the relatively early stages. Over the summer and throughout the fall semester, sample fodder from the six different cultivars was collected, dried, and ground. While we are coordinating the transfer of materials to Dr. Lin and his team for chemical analysis, the elderberry dry matter percentages have been cataloged. This chart shows the average dry matter percent at each collection site and date during the 2021 calendar year. The final two collection dates are of significant importance as these occurred after the berries were harvested and will fall within the window of time that the plants will be used as a fodder source. When the dry matter content average over these two months of the sample cycle is compared with several common grasses and legume forages, elderberry is already showing promising results for use as a livestock fodder source. We await the results of the chemical analysis to further reinforce this preliminary data. If elderberry is proven to be safe for livestock consumption, it would allow farmers the opportunity to diversify production and strengthen the financial stability of their farms. Thank you. My name is Seth Chrisman. I'm a master's student and research assistant in the Conway lab. My project is on ground floor response during establishment of woodland civil pasture in the Missouri Ozarks. Pre-settlement, it is estimated that 65% of forested land in the Missouri Ozarks were woodland ecosystems with a diverse ground flora. But land use change and fire suppression have resulted in densification and reductions in the richness and abundance of herbaceous species. Restoration of oak woodlands is a key management goal in Missouri. While unmanaged forest grazing with livestock has detrimental ecological impacts, including reductions in plant community richness and is discouraged by agencies, limited research exists on the ground floor effects of restoring unmanaged woodlands using intensively managed civil pasture, an agroforestry practice in which trees, forages, and livestock are intentionally integrated and intensively managed. This project began a long-term study evaluating ecological response to woodland silvo pasture, which is being conducted at Wordak Research Center in Cook Station, Missouri. The objectives of this study are to evaluate the herbaceous plant community richness and abundance during establishment of woodland silvo pasture, and to determine the biomass and nutritive value of native forage species during the establishment of woodland silvo pasture. Over the summer, a plant inventory was taken on 90 acres of minimally managed upland oak hickory forest. 
44 nested fixed area plots were established to measure overstory and midstory density and structure and understory plant community richness and abundance. Early next year, treatments will include density reduction to a basal area of approximately 30 to 40 square feet per acre, with half the plot subjected to a prescribed burn. A split plot within each treatment will include seeding or no seeding of a native forage mix. This figure shows the existing overstory diameter distribution by species group. You'll notice that the majority of trees are in smaller diameter classes. The mean DBH of trees is 10 and a half inches. The average basal area is 118 square feet per acre with an average of 163 trees per acre. This figure shows the mean understory plant cover by functional group. Graminoids, which includes grasses, sedges, and rushes, are at only 2% coverage. Forbs are at 10%, and woody species, which include vines, shrubs, and tree seedlings, constitute 16% coverage. These data demonstrate the low coverage of herbaceous flora on site and a shift in community toward a denser midstory with more woody species. It's hypothesized that treatments will increase herbaceous richness and abundance in the understory. Just as a reference structure, on the left is a photo of a woodland ecosystem at Haha Tonka State Park. You notice the open structure and abundance and diversity of herbaceous vegetation in the understory. And on the right is a photo of one of my research plots at Wordak Research Center. Note the denser midstory and overstory structure and the lack of herbaceous flora. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Jo Schreiber, and I am a master student under Dr. Harley Nauman. I'm here to update everyone on my project located at HARC, which focuses on the establishment of native plant species for livestock forage in silvopasture systems. This project started in the fall of 2019, and we just finished collecting data for year two this past September. Our project had two primary objectives. The first was determining the success of establishment of 23 native plant species, which include cool and warm season grasses, forbs, and legumes, into two existing silvopasture systems, which were black walnut and pitch loblolly pine with an open pasture as a control. The second objective was determining whether or not there was a difference in environmental factors between these treatments and if those differences impacted which species established and or their rate of establishment. As I mentioned earlier, we just finished collecting data for year two in September, so the data for this presentation is only representative of year one. Some additional things that we've accomplished have been the creation of two YouTube videos about the project, thanks to Cheryl, and then I also had the opportunity to present my first year's data in the Robert F. Barnes Graduate Student Poster Competition at the Crop Sciences Annual Meeting this past November. This first set of graphs shows the environmental data we collected using hobo data loggers, which were connected to PAR, ambient temperature, and soil moisture sensors. Throughout the growing season, we rotated the loggers through random locations and three replications of each treatment. We then averaged the data into a 24-hour period for each treatment. Hours that are marked with an asterisk designate statistical differences between the treatments. So we can see that there were some differences uh, between PAR and ambient temperature uh, at some hours for the treatments, um, but there were no statistical differences for soil moisture. This next set of graphs here shows the stand counts for each treatment by plant functional group um, in plants per hectare for the year one plantings. We took initial counts in the fall of 2019 after the emergence of the cool season grasses, which were no-till drilled that September, and then everything else was no-till drilled in December after the first frost. So we then took stand counts throughout the 2020 growing season and then a final count in 2021. Um, again, an asterisk designates statistical differences between treatments. Um, we can see that there's only a couple which were in the cool season grass functional group. Um, but what these graphs show is that all functional groups had the potential to establish, but the differences in environmental factors that we saw on the previous slide may have impacted their rate of establishment. So our next steps are to analyze the year two data and also look at the environmental data in relation to the individual plant species uh, compared to these uh, broader plant functional groups to see if we can find any additional differences. So thank you all for listening and I'll be happy to take any questions.